Uh, thanks for coming, and um, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the welcome and the weather. Uh, it's actually a treat if you live in Florida to see snow, um, I, although I didn't expect it in May. Um, and uh, I do actually, I'm going to start a little bit backwards because, because the introduction mentioned a couple of things. Um, it's not really about the relationship between the Jewish faith and the Catholic faith. I think that's already setting up the wrong paradigm. Um, the Judaism and the Catholic Church are two phases of the same plan for salvation. The Catholic Church is essentially post-Messianic Judaism, and Judaism is essentially pre-Messianic Catholicism. And it's, it's one storyline, it's one plan for salvation that began in the Garden of Eden and is only going to end, so to speak, at the Second Coming. And of course, that, that plan's center point and transformation took place when the long-awaited Jewish Messiah finally came and transformed Judaism into its fulfilled version, which is the Catholic faith. So I, anyway, I just wanted to do that because, because um, there's too much confusion now as though they're like two parallel faiths. And they're not parallel at all, they're sequential. Anyway, okay, but I'm not supposed to start there, right? I'm supposed to start with my witness testimony. Um, if you invite a former professor, you have to expect, expect a pedant. Um, so anyway, but I'll start with my witness testimony. So um, as was mentioned, my parents were German Jewish Holocaust refugees. They both grew up in Germany. And my father actually uh, left Germany early in Hitler's uh, power, reign of power, when the Jews were still allowed to leave as long as <clears throat> they didn't take anything with them. And he was a young man, and, and uh, actually he, he was listening to radio, and he heard, I think it was Goering say, we're going to drive the Jews from the universities, we're going to drive them from the you know, businesses, we're going to drive them from the banks, and he essentially turned off the radio and said it's time to get out of here. Uh, my mother was less fortunate. Her family fled to France and actually to Paris, which didn't last long and all soon fell uh, under the Third Reich. As a matter of fact, there's, there's an old joke, uh, excuse, excuse me, because it may offend a few of you here, but uh, how many Frenchmen does it take to defend Paris? Does anyone know? Nobody knows. It's never been tried. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so that didn't last long. And she actually got caught up, uh, she was actually arrested by the Gestapo and being held for the next train to the concentration camps, but managed to escape and eventually make it to the United States. So I grew up very much in this, this uh, aftermath of the Holocaust. And um, my whole world growing up was Jewish. Uh, in those days, actually, there was less, less mixing. Actually, there was less ability to mix. And like the, parent, the town that my parents bought a house in outside of New York City was the only town in the area that allowed Jews to buy houses. Um, towns were still what was called restricted. And uh, I was in high school before the local country club um, decided to allow Jewish members and stuff. So it was a very different, you know, different kind of segregated world. And um, all my friends were Jewish growing up. Um, all my parents' friends were Jewish. Uh, I went to Jewish religious education from the beginning of the school years until I left for college. Um, and I took my Judaism very seriously. As a matter of fact, in my late, late high school years, I um, fell under the spell of a Hasidic rabbi, you know, the Hasids with the long ear curls and black coats. And uh, I actually spent the summer between high school and college living with him and traveling with him in Israel, a kind of you know, kind of a disciple at his feet. And I considered not returning to the United States and starting university in the fall, but entering the closest thing Judaism had to religious life, which was a life of a study and prayer in a yeshiva in Jerusalem. But I didn't. I returned to the United States. I, I started MIT, and uh, that's where I lost my faith. And I lost it. Um, actually, I lost it under two influences, I'll tell the truth. Um, one of them is under the pseudoscientific worldview that religion is just a superstition man came up with to give him the answers to things, but now we have science to give us the real answers to everything. And anything that science doesn't have an answer to today, it will in five years. And um, I 
bought that. And so over the course of my time at MIT, I, I actually, I still wanted to believe in God, but I didn't think I could in good faith believe in God. That it was kind of like a willed suspension of reality to believe in God. Now, now I know, I call that a pseudo-scientific worldview, not a scientific worldview. It's the opposite of a scientific worldview because the essence of science is you look at the data, you look at the evidence, you form a theory that can explain the evidence. If it's successful in explaining the evidence, you can hold on to that theory. If it can't explain the evidence, you have to reject that theory and find one that can explain the evidence. And I think because of the kind of scientific orientation of our age, God has been unprecedentedly, unprecedentedly uh, generous in giving us physical, um, can, uh, uh, physical proof of the truths of the faith. I saw some of the, the slides going up. I mean, we have the Shroud of Turin, which even today, with all of our 2023 technology, could not be counterfeited. Uh, we have the, the miracle at Fatima, the miracle of the sun, which was seen by 80 to 100,000 people, including skeptics and atheists. And, and actually, um, uh, there, there was a a communist government at the time, so the, the, the government newspaper sent a reporter to Fatima to cover the non-event, to make fun of all the ignorant peasants who thought something would happen. And um, unfortunately for him, he, he sent in his, his report, um, and he tried to be as insulting as possible, but he admitted that the sun danced in the sky and fell to the earth, and when he got back to Lisbon, he was fired. So anyway, that's not science. That's not science when you say, I don't care what the evidence is, it can't be true, so there must be something wrong with the evidence. Science is the opposite. And we have all of these. We have the medical miracles at Lourdes and so forth. Um, we have the Eucharist, the Eucharistic miracles. And they're not just like the ones from the Middle Ages. We have, uh, there were two in Buenos Aires, I think 1995 and 1999, when when Bergoglio was the, um, I think he was Archbishop at the time. Uh, there was one in um, Poland in 2007. And in all of these cases, because they were in modern times, the Eucharist, which had been transformed into uh, actually the, the flesh and blood of, of Christ, was examined by forensic uh, scientists uh, who were not told what the origin of it was. And they, just examined it and, and, and could observe that it was not only uh, human blood and human heart muscle tissue, but of a man who had died in great agony because there's a chemical change in the blood which takes place from, from the suffering. And in one of those miracles, I think it's the Polish one, the, the host had uh, transformed into the human muscle tissue, but only halfway across the host. So you have the, the, essentially you have the bread and, and there, this, you can see photographs of this under an electron microscope. You, you have the bread that the cells of the bread morph into the cells of the human muscle tissue uh, continually. There isn't, a, there isn't a dividing line that just kind of is a gradual transition. Again, I mean, it could not even be counterfeited if you wanted to. So a true scientific attitude would have to be um, no, materialism doesn't explain these phenomena. We have to allow for something else. And of course, um, many of those uh, miracles are very specifically Catholic. But anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, I wish I knew this at the time, but I didn't. And so I left MIT atheist, and I went on after a few years as a computer science engineer to Harvard Business School. And I did well enough there to be invited back to join the faculty upon graduation. So I found myself as a newly minted professor of marketing at, I think it was the age of 29 at Harvard Business School. And that's really when the bottom fell out of my world because again, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, all my life I felt uh, since I was a small child, there has to be a real meaning and purpose to life. And someday when I'm older, I'll come into the real meaning and purpose of life. As a child, I thought that would come from entering into a personal relationship with God which I thought would happen when I grew older. As a matter of fact, I expected it to happen at my bar mitzvah, which is like the Jewish parallel to the confirmation, 
when the child is about 13, there's a ceremony in synagogue when um, he enters religious adulthood. And I really thought that on my bar mitzvah, somehow the veil would drop and I would enter a personal relationship with God. And when that didn't happen, it was actually one of the saddest days of my childhood. But then pretty soon I decided the real meaning and purpose of life would come when I got a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> or when I left home and, and went to university or when I got a girlfriend or if I got into Harvard Business School and so forth. So I kind of externalized this sense of when meaning would come to my life. But the problem was here I was already more successful in my worldly career than I ever expected to be, being a professor at Harvard Business School, but life still had no meaning or purpose. We're just a kind of chemical accident, a bolt of lightning hit a puddle of amino acids five billion years ago, and eventually we crawled out. We live for 80 or 90 years, 100 years. There's no meaning or purpose to anything. We're, we die and that's it. Um, you know, things just happen. There's, you know, there's absolutely, anyway, it was a, it was a very, dark despair, actually, because, because uh, at this point there was nothing more I could look forward to that I thought might somehow make my life feel like it had meaning, but there was none. It was all just a pointless exercise. And uh, it was in that that I received the most spectacular grace of my life. I was, I was just walking in nature early one morning. That's the only place I could find comfort in those days, was to be alone in a beautiful place in nature. I had long since lost any hope of believing in God. I, I was um, walking in a nature preserve of, I mean, uh, anyway, it, it was, uh, there's a very beautiful stretch of, of uh, uh, coast in, in Massachusetts in, on Cape Cod, and this was one of the national forests on Cape Cod, and it was, it was like you have, this, you have the uh, ocean, and you have the beach, and then you have the sand dunes, and it gradually gets transformed into a kind of pine forest, and it was in the kind of transitional area where the pine forest was kind of getting more and more sandy and, and becoming more like sand dunes. But anyway, I was just walking along, lost in my thoughts, when from one moment to the next, there's really no way to describe it, but the curtain between the spiritual world and the physical world disappeared, and I found myself uh, looking into the spiritual world, but much more dramatic than that was I found myself in a state of very intimate uh, communion, communication with God, um, and seeing my life, understanding my life, actually experiencing things as though I had died and was looking back over my life in the presence of God. And I saw how I would feel about everything after I died. I saw that my two greatest regrets when I died would be number one, all of the time and energy I had wasted worrying about not being loved when every moment of my existence I was held in an ocean of love greater than I ever imagined could exist coming from this all-knowing, all-loving God. And the other great regret would be every hour I had wasted doing nothing of value in the eyes of heaven. I saw it's all true. I saw that we live forever. I saw that every action has a moral content that's observed and recorded for all eternity. I saw that every time we take advantage of the opportunity to do something of value in the eyes of heaven, we will very literally be rewarded for all eternity, that every opportunity that we let go by and don't take advantage of will be a lost opportunity for all eternity. I saw how foolish I had been. I had kind of lived my life uh, looking in the rearview mirror, saying to myself, oh, if only that hadn't happened, then I would be happy today, or if only that hadn't happened, then I would be happy today. When in fact, absolutely everything that had ever happened to me had been the most perfect thing that could be arranged coming from the hands of an all-knowing, all-loving God, not only including those things that had caused the most suffering at the time, that I had thought of as the greatest disasters at the time, but especially those things that had caused the most suffering at the time. And by far the um, biggest most transformative aspect of this experience was coming into the direct experience of God's extremely uh, personal love and involvement of me. I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. But um, I saw that, that God, God himself, the God who not only created everything that exists, but created existence itself, not only knew me by name, 
not only had been arranging absolutely everything that had happened to me to be the most perfect thing possible, but had been watching over me and caring about me every moment of my existence as though I were the only creature he had ever created and as though in a very real way everything that made me happy made him happy and everything that made me sad made him sad. And uh, experiencing this, coming into this awareness uh, absolutely changed everything. Of course I saw there was never any reason to be anxious about anything. I saw that every moment of our life has this infinite depth of meaning because it has the possibility of doing something of value in the eyes of heaven. And, and I, I have to apologize for this in a way, but uh, uh, conversion doesn't take place instantaneously. I mean, this, this knowledge came, took place instantaneously, but I, is, conversion is a very long process. That's why our lives are long. But so I, here I had, been a totally, I had been totally selfish. Um, I thought it was right to be totally selfish. I didn't know there was anything wrong with being totally selfish at the time. Um, I was a professor of marketing at Harvard Business School, which is a graduate training in selfishness. And I still, <laughs> I still saw this experience somewhat through that perspective. And so I saw in this experience, I didn't see what was wrong with my being selfish. What I saw was I had been stupidly selfish because I had been putting all my time and energy into things which wouldn't do me any good at all, even a hundred years later, once I was dead. And if I wanted to be smart and selfish, the only thing that made sense was to try to be as great a saint as possible, try to you know, do, put all of my time and energy into doing things of value in the eyes of heaven. I had this image, I had a lot of strange kind of like parables pop into my mind because I didn't have any framework for understanding this. And one of them was, I, I, I saw myself as a little, a, a little boy, uh, you know, eagerly playing a game of Monopoly, accumulating these big stacks of brightly colored paper Monopoly money and ignoring this huge stack of solid gold coins, which was right next to me. Um, and um, anyway, so uh, there were other aspects of this experience which are not totally relevant, but it was, needless to say, very neat to be seeing into the spiritual world. Um, I saw the angelic hierarchy and I saw probably the most significant thing of what I saw in seeing into the spiritual world, I mean the, by far the biggest most significant thing was the experience of God. But I also saw how, I wasn't surprised that I could see into the uh, spiritual world. The only thing that surprised me in this experience was that I could ever have been blind to it because it was so much more real, more concrete, more solid than the physical world that I didn't understand how I could ever have not seen it. And I couldn't imagine ever not seeing it in the future. And in seeing into the spiritual world, I did see how the physical world, the causality of everything in the physical world flows from the spiritual world. It's like the physical world is the tip of the iceberg above the surface of the water. And, you know, 90% is under the water and what we see, what we have in the physical world is a kind of a penetration of the spiritual world into the physical world which is the causality of what happens in the physical world. I'm not a theologian, don't ask me to explain that. I, you know, I can, only, um, I can only describe kind of what I saw. But anyway, needless to say this is very neat. I was happier than I had ever been in my life. I uh, went back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is where Harvard is and where I was living at the time, happier than I had ever been. I instantly lost any interest in teaching Harvard MBAs how to make a little more money, and all I wanted to do was pursue this experience, find out who this God was, and how to worship and serve him properly. I skipped over something, so I have to go back. So I'm in this experience. I'm in this incredibly intimate communion with God, I couldn't, put, I couldn't have a question in my mind without being shown the answer. It was like I had a, a searchlight on my forehead and wherever I looked, the answer sprang forth. So um, I knew that this God who was revealing himself to me was my Lord and God and Master, needless to say, but I didn't know who he was. I wanted to know how to follow him. I couldn't think of this as Judaism and the God of Judaism. Now I know that it was the same God. But um, in all fairness, when you read the Old Testament, the picture of God that emerges is, of a, is a, of a God far more distant and severe than this God was. 
And by the way, that isn't because there's something wrong with the Old Testament. Um, it's not because they had it wrong. It's because the entire relationship between divinity and humanity was, guess what, transformed with the coming of Christ. That's why he came, right? Divinity flowed into humanity in a way that it never had before. The entire relationship between God and man was transformed. The, um, in the days of the Old Testament, God really was much more distant. And if you read the Old Testament, ordinary people had no communication with God. There's a, there's a passage, I think it's in Joel, where he says, the day is coming when you won't have to run to this person and that person and say, tell me about God, but I will make myself known to the lowliest manservant and maidservant among you. And St. Peter, in the first Pentecost hom sermon, cited that passage and saying, this is what's happened. So anyway, so, but this is all a little bit of a, I guess, a, a tangent. So anyway, I couldn't think of this as, as Judaism, but I knew that I wanted to nothing but, you know, to, to worship and serve this God properly. So I prayed as I was, um, I was actually literally still walking at the time. I prayed as I was walking, let me know your name so I know what religion to follow to worship and serve you properly. I don't mind if you're Buddha and I have to become Buddhist. I don't mind if you're Christian and I have to become Hindu. I don't mind if you're Apollo and I have to become a Roman pagan, as long as you're not Christ and I have to become Christian. <laughs> and I very literally prayed that. Now, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to be a little free form tonight. I don't know why I feel very comfortable with you guys. So, so. Um, uh, I was not anti-Christian or anti-Catholic at all. As a matter of fact, when I went to MIT, uh, the only MIT student I wanted as a roommate was a devout Catholic because he was happy and peaceful and all of the New York Jews like me were neurotic and angry all the time. <laughs> uh, and actually, I went to great lengths to get him as a roommate. Um, but um, it wasn't anti being anti-Christian at all. It was being anti-Christianity because the Jewish view that I had grown up with was that um, basically Christianity was, well, that, excuse me for, I, uh, for saying this, I'm just describing it, but the, the view that I grew up with was that Jesus was a false messiah. If, I mean, look, if Christianity, if you're going to be Jewish, Jesus had to be a false messiah, right? That Jesus was a false messiah, that his followers had come up with this this uh, heresy off of Judaism called Christianity. And as a result, the Jews have been persecuted for the last 2,000 years. So, you know, Christianity was the enemy, not Catholics or Christians or anything. But anyway, that's what was behind this, you know, as long as I don't have to become Christian. It was like going over to the enemy. It was like, it was, anyway. So I literally prayed that, and I wasn't ready to hear it at the time, obviously. So he didn't reveal that to me. But I went back home, uh, happier than I had ever been. And after that experience, all I wanted to do was find out who this was. So every night before going to sleep, I would say a short prayer I had made up to know the name of my Lord and God and Master who had revealed himself to me that day. And a year to the day after that first experience, I, I, I prayed that prayer before going to sleep. And I also prayed a prayer of thanksgiving for what had happened exactly a year earlier. And I went to sleep. And I thought I was awoken by a hand gently on my shoulder and led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could imagine. And I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. And when I found myself in her presence, all I wanted to do was fall on my knees and honor her somehow appropriately. The first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. Um, the first thought that went through my mind was because, since I did want to honor her somehow, um, the first kind of thought I had was, oh my goodness, I wish I at least knew the Hail Mary, but I didn't. <laughs> so when, um, when she offered to answer any questions, I kind of wanted to ask her to teach me the Hail Mary, but I was too proud to admit I didn't know it. So as a kind of indirect way of getting her to teach it to me, I asked her what her favorite prayer to her was. <laughs> And her initial answer was a little bit coy. It was, I love all prayers to me. But I was a little bit pushy. Maybe that's because of my background. Who knows? But I said, but you must love some prayers to you more than others. And she relented, and she recited a prayer. 
but in Portuguese, and I didn't know any Portuguese. <laughs> so all I could do was make the effort to remember the first few syllables phonetically, and the next morning when I woke up, I immediately wrote them down phonetically. And then much later, when I met a Portuguese Catholic woman, I asked her to recite the Marian prayers in Portuguese, and to the best of my ability, I identified the prayer as, O oh Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us, have recourse to thee. Now, let me go back to that initial encounter moment. Um, she was indescribably beautiful, unimaginably beautiful, of course, to look at. But even more profoundly affecting than her visual beauty was the beauty of her voice. And when she spoke, um, this, the only way I can describe her voice is to say that it was made up out of that which makes music, music. And when she spoke, this incredibly beautiful voice flowed straight through me, carrying with it her love, and lifting me up into a state of ecstasy greater than I ever imagined could exist. Um, I also um, knew, as I, 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 as I said, when I found myself in her presence, I was overwhelmed by who she was, and um, not just her beauty, and not just the love that flowed from her, which, which was a state of ecstasy. I mean, it, it, I mean, it did bring me into a state of ecstasy. But I also actually saw her, how, um, how glorious she is. I don't know what the right word is. And uh, she, she had said she, she had offered to answer any questions I might have for her. So I asked her about maybe six or seven questions. Some of them were foolish, but some of them weren't. Um, and, and most of the questions came out of being overwhelmed by who she was. So at one point, I asked her, I, it was more of an exclamation than a question, but I kind of stammered out, how can it be? How is it possible? How can it be that you're so glorious, that you're so magnificent, that you're so exalted? And her response was just to look down on me almost with pity and shake her head gently and say, oh no, you don't understand. You don't understand anything. I'm nothing. I'm a creature. I'm a created thing. He's everything. And then again, out of the desire to honor her somehow appropriately, I asked her what title she liked best for herself. And she said, I am the beloved daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Spirit. And then um, the, the, the last of the good questions I asked her, I guess, was by now I figured out, okay, this is the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was Christ in the previous experience. This is all about Christianity. I better get up to speed pretty quick. And I, I had never literally touched a New Testament, much less opened one. Um, and I knew nothing uh, except I had heard the expression, the Holy Spirit. I had no idea what it meant. But I figured I'd better get up to speed pretty quick. So I, I asked her, and I apologize for the way I phrased this, but I didn't know any better. I said, uh, what's this business about the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and her response was just to look upwards with an expression melting with love and say, he's his gaze, G-A-Z-E, gaze. G -A -Z -E, gaze. Um, anyway, then I asked her a few other questions, which were either foolish or, or personal. And then uh, after I was finished with the questions, um, she said she had something she wanted to say to me. So she spoke for another 10 or 15 minutes. And then the audience was ended, and I went back to sleep. Now, I, let me jump back and say something. I now understand that if there was a camera in the room, it would have shown me asleep in bed throughout this experience. I, did not, I was not aware of that at the time. I thought I was awake. My memory represents it as though I was awake. Um, but I now understand that my body was asleep in bed during it. I, I tell the truth, for, for months afterwards, I probably would have started swinging if anybody had told me this happened while I was asleep. But now I understand that it did. So anyway, the next morning when I woke up, um, I, I knew it had been Christ in, the, uh, in that initial experience. I knew that I wanted nothing other than to be as completely and fully a Christian as possible. And I was uh, hopelessly in love with the Blessed Virgin Mary. In fact, my first thought when I woke up that morning was, oh boy, I can't wait to go to sleep again tonight and see her again. <laughs> 
And when that didn't happen, I said to myself, well, it's going to happen at least like once a week, right, or once a month. And that was actually a grace, because if I had woken up that morning and understood that it would be another 60 years or so before I got to see her again, I don't know how I could have faced life, because everything in this world was so colorless and drab and tasteless and cardboard and gray compared to being in the presence of her love that it would have been a very, very hard uh, prospect to face. And by the time I realized that that was the case, the memory had faded to the point where, where I could um, you know, accept that. So, um, uh, okay, I, I'm going to just tell one, I mean, you know, I could go on and on and on and on uh, with, you know, I mean, it still took a couple of years to find my way into the Catholic Church. I didn't know the difference between a Catholic and a Protestant. Um, I, I didn't know anything, and I went, you know, took a couple of wrong paths. Although I first started, I mean, when I woke up that morning, I knew I wanted to be Christian. I opened a phone book, found a Christian church to go to, it was Protestant. Uh, as soon as I felt comfortable with the pastor, I kind of shyly asked him about the Blessed Virgin Mary, and when he responded without the respect that I knew that was due to her, I knew there's no place for me. And, um, and then the other thing wh that was going on was, there was a shrine to Our Lady of La Salette about 40 minutes from my house. That was a church-approved Marian apparition in, I think, 1846 in the French Alps. And um, I used to go to that shrine three or four times a week just to walk the grounds, to feel her presence, uh, to kind of commune with her. I still didn't know the Hail Mary. Um, I still didn't know any prayers, but just kind of to talk to her and, and feel her presence and stuff. And when I was there, sometimes there'd be a mass going on, and whenever I was around a mass going on, um, I was filled with a uh, tremendous desire to receive communion, even though I didn't know what it was. So those are the two things that brought me pretty directly into the Catholic Church, was knowing who the Blessed Virgin Mary is and wanting to receive communion uh, daily, if at all possible. As a matter of fact, when I first tried to find a priest to baptize me, I didn't understand that the Catholic Church was the fullness of the truth and Protestant sects aren't. But I did know that um, if I get baptized Catholic, I can receive communion daily if I want. And if I get baptized Lutheran or something, I'll be lucky to get it twice a month. So <laughs> I, guess, I guess that kind of mercantile, I don't want to be anti-Semitic, so I'm not going to attribute it to my ethnicity. But that kind of mercantile background does serve a, can serve a useful purpose. And as in fact, Jesus himself says so, right? He said, the children of this world are wiser in their pursuits than the children of light. So, you know, if you're going to be looking for the best bargain, you might as well be looking for the best bargain in the right sense, which is our eternity, right? So anyway, um, there's only one story I'm going to tell, I think, because it, it says a lot about the relationship between Judaism and, and the Catholic Church. And then I'm going to take a break, um, and then, uh, then I'll continue with, with a little of the relationship between Judaism and Catholicism, but this will be a little bit of a segue. So um, I, I, I went to the real La Salette that following winter. I was on a ski trip to France, and I uh, rained for a few days straight. I figured I'll take a break. I, I knew about La Salette, I got in the rental car, I drove to, drove to the real La Salette, which is incredibly beautiful, it's about 12,000 feet, it's way above tree line in the Alps, just, you know, uh, granite cliffs and snow bowls and absolutely nothing, it's like 10 miles from the nearest village, and, but there's a, there's a retreat house there, there's a, there's a basilica there, and it was incredibly beautiful, and I, I stayed there actually, I was stuck there for the rest of the trip, which was Providence, and when I was there, uh, I was talking to an elderly French woman who was a pilgrim there. And when she heard my story, she, well, actually what happened was I came back to the US. She called me and she said, I think it would be a good idea if you checked out the Carthusians. Now, I don't know how many of you, I think at least one of you know who the Carthusians are, but they are the strictest contemplative order in the Catholic Church. If you've seen the movie Integrate Silence, that's the Carthusian monastery. They, they live in solitary confinement. They live in strict silence. They eat one meal a day. They never talk to each other, except they have like a, it's a long story, but you know, maybe a, a half an hour of recreation once a week where they can talk. They, they work in their cells. They eat in their cells. It's solitary confinement, as I said. 
and they never sleep through the night. They break sleep every night. They, they sleep from like 9 to 11.30, and then they get up to chant matins and lauds, and then they go back to sleep for a few hours, and then they get up for mass. It's a very penitential life, a very rigorous life, a very contemplative life. And when I heard about it, I thought, oh, good, because I was dying to find somebody who understood what had happened to me and could tell me something about these mystical experiences. And so when I heard about them, I figured, well, these guys must have mystical experiences or they'd go nuts. It's not true, but anyway, that's what I thought. So I picked up the phone and I called this monastery, it was in France, and I, I said, uh, would it be possible to come and visit? And the monk who answered said, oh no, absolutely not. We're strictly cloistered, we don't receive anybody. But then he said, tell me something about yourself. And so I started talking to him and I could tell from his voice that he was wavering in his resolve. And so I said, should I write you a letter? And he said, excellent idea, send me a letter. So I wrote him and he immediately wrote back, you're welcome any time. What I, what I didn't know was there one exception to not receiving anybody is if they think it's a possible vocation. So I get on a plane, I show up at this Carthusian monastery, beautiful, you know, like maybe 14th century, just absolutely out of the Middle Ages, gorgeous um, in the mountains of the south of France. And I knock on the door and I show up there and I'm very warmly welcomed. And four things happened there, which basically turned me around in with relation to the Catholic Church and so forth. The first thing that happened was I had a room there. I was, of course, the only outsider there. And um, every, uh, every day after the one meal of the day, the prior would come to my cell and knock on the door and ask if I had any questions to give me you know, spiritual direction or whatever. And I'd ask him any questions or whatever, and then he would leave. And then he'd come back the next day, same thing. And I was expecting him to give me the sales pitch about why I should become Catholic. Right? This is everything I heard of growing up, you know, how heavy-handed they are and, you know, all the, whatever, forced conversions and everything. So, you know, I figure, well, tomorrow's the day he's going to give me the sales pitch. So the next day he knocks on the door and just gently says, you know, is there, do you have any questions? And anyway, and, and he doesn't give me the sales pitch. So finally I can't stand the suspense anymore. So the next time he knocks on the door, I throw open the door and say, aren't you going to tell me why I should become Catholic? And he just says, oh, no. Not at all. All I ask is that you keep your eyes open and be honest with yourself about what you see. This was a huge revelation to me because obviously he thought this was God at work. He, he believed in all of this stuff. Um, and, and, you know, God would finish what he started. And all that I had to do was keep my eyes open and be honest with myself about what I see. So the first big brick fell, right, because I had this kind of aggressive, defensive posture which I couldn't hold up anymore in the face of his, his like gentle confidence. So the next thing that happened was after a few days I started joining them in, in choir uh, at night, you know, and getting up at 11.30 and going into the um, choir stalls and, um, you know, and, and while they chanted matins. Now, in, in, I mean, I can't describe it, Un, unspeakably beautiful, you know, heavy walnut stalls, um, they're, they're um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the word, but they're, the, the, the books that they were chanting the Psalms out of were like, I don't want to say they were from the Middle Ages, but they were like, you know, they were parchment, they were like three feet across, there were two monks to one book, and so forth, and I'm standing there in the stall for three hours every night, in the middle of the night, looking left and right, and there are all these, there are these, you know, mostly elderly monks chanting. And what are they chanting? They're chanting, O oh, Jerusalem, no place on earth is as beautiful as you. O oh, Jerusalem, should I forget you let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth? O oh, Mount Zion, you know, the most beautiful place on earth, and so forth. And I look to my left and my right, and I say to myself, these guys are all wannabe Jews. <laughs> And, um, and, then, um, and then I'm working in my job one day, which is scything the grass in the orchard, and this elderly monk shuffles out to me because since they're not allowed to talk, sometimes they take advantage to bend the rules a little bit. He uh, shuffled out to me and he says kind of shyly, uh, do you mind if I ask you a question? And I said, no, not at all. And he says, well then, if you don't mind me asking, uh, 
you're not Catholic, are you? Because we noticed you weren't receiving communion. And I said, no, that's right, I'm not Catholic. And then he said, well then, if you don't mind me asking, we were all wondering, uh, what are you then? And I stand up tall and I said, I'm Jewish. And he says, oh, that's a relief. We were all afraid you were Protestant. <laughs> so, um, you, you can see, right, you can see the transformation that had to take place in my attitude because first of all, this wasn't about this heavy-handed oppressiveness. Second of all, they did really think of themselves, as, I'm not saying they would want to be Jews, but that they were the inheritors of Judaism. And third of all, the, that monk's response to me was that the Jews have not yet received the gift of the truth, um, uh, whereas the Protestants had it and rejected it. So, so all of my sense that from the eyes of the Catholic Church were the enemy went away. All three of those, right? All three of those incidents made me no longer see that in the eyes of the Catholic Church we were the enemy, but in the eyes of the Catholic Church we were, you know, I, I mean, John Paul II said, our elder brothers in the faith. But the final thing that happened at the monastery, which was in a way the biggest thing, was if somebody had told me about the life these, these monks lead, uh, so penitential and so dry and and uh, I would have expected to see a bunch of grumpy, ill-tempered old men. And instead, they were like joyful kindergartners sharing a secret, almost on the verge of giggles. And I understood when I was there that what filled their life with, with love and a kind of a, a beauty, a kind of beautiful, feminine gentleness was the presence of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that, again, in a way that I can't theologically justify, I saw how, how the uh, Blessed Virgin Mary is the animating spirit of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church is like the institutional structure around the Blessed Virgin Mary. So my love for the Blessed Virgin Mary became a love for the Catholic Church and a desire to become Catholic. So, um, and I actually went back there actually after my baptism to explore vocation, but I didn't last. <laughs> I don't think I lasted two weeks. <laughs> Um, as soon as it got serious, right? Because as soon as it became like, okay, now every day for the rest of your life is going to be like this. It's like, uh, get me out of here. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, I loved it as long as I was flirting with it. But anyway, so that's it for the witness testimony part. Of it. I'm, when, when we come back, I'm trying to be obedient. When we come back, I'll talk about the theology a little bit. Uh, and I'll definitely take Q&A that, you know, it can be about anything, including the witness right. testimony. Thank you. I, I know that there's a lot of wonderful stuff about that series, The Chosen, but, but um, I think what, one of the things that bothers me a little bit is that um, Christianity is intensely sacramental, and Judaism is intensely sacramental. And when you strip the sacraments out of Christianity, you strip the Judaism out of Christianity. Um, so, so um, I, and, uh, anyway, so the the <laughs> I really wasn't planning to start here. Think think about think about the birth of Christianity, like, like when, when, what was the first Catholic Mass? First Catholic Mass was, was a Passover Seder, right? The Passover Seder is like the central sacrament of Judaism, and the, the Last Supper was simultaneously the last sacramental Passover Seder and the first sacramental Catholic Mass. How do you get the transition from Judaism into Christianity if you strip out the sacraments. Um, um, don't blame me, I, and I'm, I mean, I, I'm not expressing my own theology here, but uh, Jesus said that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Um, in Judaism, if you don't eat the pass, if you don't celebrate the Passover Seder, you lose your salvation. You're cut off from your people and you lose your salvation. I mean, the, 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 the parallel, I mean, you know, is, is overwhelming. 
Um, and, uh, and so I guess that's, that's my nervousness about, about, um, uh, about <laughs> ecumenicism, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> um, the, uh, okay, so where should I start? Okay, I'll just start at the beginning, Garden of Eden. Um, <laughs> because as I said right before I began the talk at all, the uh, Judaism and the Catholic Church are not like two separate religions. They're two phases of the same plan for salvation of all of mankind that God came up with. Actually, of course, he's outside of time, but you could say he came up with at the time that Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, right? Because when God first created man, he created him to live in a state of continuous intimacy with God, uh, uh, no death, right, no suffering, no separation between uh, you know, no, no alienation of man from God, this, this continual intimacy and, and basically heaven. And when man chose to sin, that initial incredibly exalted state of man was shattered and man fell, but God knew at that very moment that at some point in the f future, he would not only restore mankind to the original blessed state, but to an, actually an infinitely higher state through the incarnation of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity as a man at a future point in time. If the second person of the Most Holy Trinity was going to incarnate as a man at a future point in time, it would be among a particular people in a particular place in the world, even in the womb of a particular virgin, and of course that people would have to be prepared. They would have to be separated out from all of the other tribes wandering the face of the earth for almost 2,000 years. They would have to be kept separate, and they would have to gradually be given a tremendous amount of divine revelation to first of all know about the one true uncreated creator God, to know about the creation of man, the fall of man, the seriousness of sin, the need for redemption, the future coming of a redeemer. They would have to be given enough revelation to be able to identify the uh, redeemer when he came and to understand what was happening and to propagate the faith in God throughout the world. That's what the Jewish people were. They were, you could say, chosen at random to prepare for the incarnation. And uh, with the intention always being that when the incarnation took place, that original kind of special relationship between God and the Jewish people would be extended to all of mankind in an infinitely greater way through faith in Christ and through the sacraments. So the, the Jewish people were really just, you could say they were like an incubator or something for the Catholic Church, right? And, and, and uh, you know, growing up all my life, growing up, I heard about the Jews being the chosen people, that they're to be the light to the Gentiles and so forth. You know, what's that mean? And, you know, chosen, chosen for what? You know, it sounds like a lot of chauvinism. It was all true. But what they don't realize is what they were chosen for was to bring Christ, to literally bring salvation to all of mankind through Christ and Christianity, right? It's a very simple story, but it's, it's phase one and phase two of the same plan for salvation. Any questions? Okay, well now, glad you like to talk. No, so let me uh, let me uh, take out a um, a New Testament here because, okay, so if that was the um, if that was what Judaism was all about, so to speak, you could say, well, what a shame that they blew it when he came and didn't recognize him. Now, first of all, by definition, they can't have blown it because they were chosen to bring about the incarnation of God as man, and it came about. They were chosen to spread the fruits of that to all of mankind, and it has been spread to all of mankind. So by definition, they succeeded in their task, right? But the fact remains that many of them, most of them, did not recognize Christ when he came. Now, um, so I am going to very quickly go through Romans 11 because I want to talk about two things. One is the mystery of the Jews' failure to recognize Christ, and number two, the role of Jews and Judaism in the period between the first and second coming of Christ. And both of those mysteries are illumined by St. Paul in Romans 11. 
because, and I'm going to skip to the end here, um, kind of give you previews of coming attractions. Uh, paragraph 674 of the New Catechism of the Catholic Church says, quote, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. Okay? Christ can't come again until his recognition by all Israel. It's as though he's up there waiting for permission to come, right? The glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. So there's clearly a very mysterious role that the Jews and Judaism still have in the unfolding of salvation, which is there has to be a widespread conversion of the Jews. If you excuse the pun, I like to say wholesale conversion of the Jews. Um, in order for the second coming to happen. And, and why this is all the case is really laid out by, by St. Paul in Romans 11. And why am I doing this? Well, one is because I'm a pedant, and this is an area of great interest to me, but also because the, um, the heart of my ministry is actually trying to encourage prayer for the conversion of the Jews. Um, because um, basically, because if a Gentile Catholic tries to encourage prayer for the conversion of the Jews, they're accused of being an anti-Semite. <laughs> but I can get away with it. But, um, you know, every Jew, and oh, by the way, I, I should actually, uh, you know, I, I, for a Jewish marketing professor, I'm not a very good salesperson, but um, one of the books, I have two books there on the book table that will be for sale. Am I, is, this is still working, right? One is Salvation is from the Jews, the role of Judaism in salvation history from Abraham to the second coming. That's this, the theology. The other is Honey from the Rock, 16 Jews find the sweetness of Christ, which is 16 Jewish to Catholic witness testimonies. And every one of those Jews who enter the Catholic Church are on fire with a desire to share the, disco the discovery that they have with other Jews. I think many of you know um, Rosalind Moss, now Mother Miriam of the Lamb of God. Um, and it's, it's universal because it's like, it's like Judaism for the first time makes sense. Um, you know, everything, it's, it's like you can really only fully enter into Judaism when you see its fulfillment in the Catholic Church, when you see how it's all true, why it's all true, and then your heart has to go out to your fellow Jews who are depriving themselves, not only, you know, of the best thing in life, but they're actually even depriving themselves of the truth of Judaism. So anyway, so that's, that's, that's why I actually do this. Also, I want to see the second coming because I'm pretty tired of the way things are going. But. <laughs> so anyway, so what, what, what do we know about these mysteries? Okay, um, I'll just start at the beginning of Romans 11. I'm going to skip verses, but I'm not adding anything. Uh, this is all really here. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So, I mean, post-Vatican II, I don't, you know, this doesn't really have to be hammered, but for a long time, the attitude among many in the Catholic Church was that because the Jews rejected Christ, God has rejected the Jews. But that's unsustainable in the face of the scriptures. Anyway, continuing. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see, and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Okay, that's really pretty radical. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see, and ears that should not hear. In other words, the failure of the Jews to recognize Christ wasn't just due to their own stubbornness and hard-heartedness, it was part of God's plan. It was a necessary part of divine providence. Then St. Paul goes on to explain why it was a necessary part of divine providence. So I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means, but through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the Gentiles, 
excuse me, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So four times in these uh, few verses, St. Paul repeats the same thing. Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Their trespass means riches for the world. Their failure means riches for the Gentiles. And uh, their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. Four times, the church could not have spread properly throughout the whole world had all of the Jews followed Christ. Right? Their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. Their rejection of Christ means the reconciliation of the entire Gentile, i.e. non-Jewish world, to Christ. Now, why, why was their rejection necessary for uh, Christianity to spread throughout the world? Well, one of the reasons we see in uh, the book of Acts, the very first church council, all of the apostles had to return to Jerusalem to resolve this thorny issue which was in danger of crippling the early church. What was that issue? It was, are we supposed to allow non-Jews into the church? Or is membership in the church supposed to be for Jews only? So if a Gentile wants to, Gentile just means non-Jew. If a Gentile wants to enter the church, do they first have to sacramentally become Jewish? Literally, this was, this was the, the, the the issue which required the calling of the first uh, church council in about 50 AD, the Council of Jerusalem. Now, of course, um, in the case of uh, males, that would have required uh, circumcision, which would have had a crippling effect on the early church. <laughs> Never mind. But um, now that danger, that, that mistake rather, that confusion about whether we should allow Gentiles in the church, you can see where it came from, right? Because Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Jesus was a Jew. Even Joseph and Mary <laughs> were Jews. All of the apostles were Jews. Um, everyone that Jesus ever evangelized during his life, with a handful of exceptions, were all Jews. As a matter of fact, what happens when the Syro-Phoenician woman comes to him? He says it's not right to give the food for the children, excuse me, to the dogs. So it certainly looked like maybe this is meant only for Jews. Now, theologically, that issue was resolved by the first church council, but practically it was resolved by the failure of the Jews to enter the church, because within a few years, there were at least as many Gentiles in the church as there were Jews, and it quickly became apparent that the church was for Jew and Gentile alike on an equal basis. But had the five million Jews around Jerusalem all flooded into the church, it would have been much harder to see how that would have happened. Um, so we see why, as St. Paul says, through their, tres their trespass was necessary for salvation to come to the Gentiles. But I will point out something else here, which is he not only says that their trespass was necessary, but he says, if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? If their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So if the Jews' failure to follow Christ was such a gift for the church, then how much greater a gift will their acceptance of Christ be when they do come into the church? And then St. Paul goes on to uh, describe this event. He uses the metaphor of the olive tree of salvation the, initial, the original olive tree of salvation was Judaism. The original cultivated branches of the olive tree were the Jews. The, uh, the roots of the olive tree were in Judaism. But, and then he goes on to say, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. If you do boast, remember, it is not you that support the root, but the root that supports you. You will say branches were broken off that I, so that I might be grafted in. That is true, but do not become proud, but stand in awe. I have to take off my glasses. <laughs> um, and even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? So you see this image kind of tells the whole story. You have the original olive tree, which is Judaism. You have the original cultivated olive branches, which were the Jews. 
but some of those original olive branches were broken off to make room to graft in wild olive branches. Those are the Gentiles grafted into the church. Now, if you're one of those grafted in wild olive branches, you might be tempted to boast and say, ha-ha, I'm so important that God broke off the original branches, but don't boast because remember, God, if God had the power to graft you in, he has the power to graft them in, and how much better will they be suited to the tree because they were originally part of the cultivated olive tree. Don't blame me. This is just, this is straight from here, okay? This is straight from St. Paul. So, and then St. Paul goes on to say, um, well, the, 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 that, the, that um, paragraph from the Catechism that I quoted, uh, references the following passage here. Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. So we see a lot of things here. One is we see where that, uh, that doctrine that the, there'll be a widespread conversion of the Jews before the second coming comes from, because he says, a hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. So the plan, as we also see in that metaphor of the olive tree, was that salvation first came to the Jews, and then they were kind of put aside while salvation went to the Gentiles, and then when the full number of the Gentiles come in, then the veil will be lifted from the eyes of the Jews, and they too will come into the church, and the church composed of Jew and Gentile will then be ready for the second coming. And then St. Paul has also explained why God did this this way, which is incredibly beautiful. Um, as regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. We already talked about that. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience, that he may have mercy upon all. Now, that doesn't necessarily spring out at you, or what St. Paul is saying, but what he's saying is, and, and, and I'm happy to be disagreed with, but it's never, ha it's never happened. Um, um, at the time that Christ came, the Jews were in relationship with God. So if they had immediately entered the church, they would have not passed through a period of disobedience. So the salvation that God gave them would not have been obviously in a sovereign act of the mercy of God, but would have been something that they thought they deserved and earned. And you see that attitude right throughout the New Testament, like, you know, we're so wonderful, this is, you know, God owes us everything. The Gentiles, when Christ came, were out of relationship with God. So when they came into the church, it was obvious that it was a sovereign act of the mercy of God. But the Jews had to pass through a period of disobedience so that when they too come into the church, it will be obvious to them that it's a sovereign act of the mercy of God. As St. Paul said, God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. God wants our salvation to be something unearned, undeserved, I mean, which it obviously is, but in order to, for it to be that and for us to recognize it as that, we have to be brought into salvation out of a state of disobedience. The Gentile state of disobedience preceded the coming of Christ, and the, the Jews' state of disobedience is in this period in between the first and second coming, but so that when they come into the church, it'll also be a sovereign act of the mercy of God, for God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. So that's it. So that's, that's the whatever it was, 15 minute, 20 minute version of the, the interplay between Jew and Gentile between the first and second coming and the meaning of Judaism and, and why the Jews are so stubborn and hard hearted and hard to convert and all of that stuff and why they have to convert for the second coming.
Uh, the question is, why do I think I had that initial theophany, that initial experience? All I have is guesses. All I have is guesses. Um, you know, I, 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 first of all, I think that um, it's not all that uncommon for, for God to show his hand a little bit when people are in total despair, you know, in total darkness. But I also think that, um, frankly, I think that um, I think that it's it, it's I think it's time for there to be a little more activity for the conversion of the Jews. I think that um, look, I mean, I'm not trying to sell books <laughs> um, anymore, but but um, this was Ignatius Press's number two bestseller the year it came out, and it's it's still selling pretty well. Um, the the you know. What happened to me indirectly lit a little fire under this whole business of um, of the Jewish roots of the Catholic Church, the need to pray for the conversion of the Jews, the continuity between Judaism and, and Catholicism. I know that, uh, I, I mean, you know, um, I know there's been a lot more Taylor Marshall and Brand Petrie and so forth, but um, but sorry, but I was this was the first <laughs> and. Um, and also what I'm doing now, and, and uh, you know, anyway, so I think, that, I think that God recruited a number of people to try to get a little fire going about the conversion of the Jews. Okay, so the question is, <clears throat> is it okay to give the collection of witness testimonies, Honey from the Rock, to a friend who is Jewish? And um, I don't know what you mean by, is it okay? I would say that, um, that there's no one answer to that. I would, it's no one answer to that. I mean, uh, do you mind if they never talk to you again? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say, I would say um, you know, test the water, st stick your toe in the water a little bit first. Um, you know, every, every situation is going to be a different situation. Uh, pray, see if, you know, see if you get a green light or a yellow light or something to doing it. Um, there's no point to doing it. As a matter of fact, it could do more harm than good. I mean, in other words, your relationship is more important than, uh, first of all, I, if, they, if they throw it in the trash, it doesn't do any good at all. And if it hurts your relationship, you lose whatever good you might be able to do. So you're, you're just going to have to feel your way in it. Okay, so the questions are, how long did my conversion take and what were my family's reactions? Um, to the first question, I mean, I could like not entirely flippantly say it's still ongoing, which is actually obviously true, but I know what you mean by the question. And um, let me think back. Okay, so there was a year between the experience of Christ when I knew about God and eternity and everything and the experience of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then there was about four years between the experience of Blessed Virgin Mary and when I was actually baptized in the church, but I had started asking to be baptized probably within a year after the experience of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was just hard. It was, <laughs> I'm sorry, it was, it was, hard. It was hard to arrange. Uh, for one thing, I wanted to know what do I have to believe to qualify to, for entry into the Catholic Church. So every time I met a priest, I would say, you know, I want to enter the church. What do I have to believe to qualify? I never got the same answer twice. It went from, you know, nothing. You just have to want to be Catholic to you have to believe, you know, everything in the catechism, whatever. Uh, so, and I want to do it right, you know, legitimately. So that was really hard. And then, um, uh, then I, anyway, but so that was hard. And it also took me a long time to, that was actually a grace because I wanted to become Catholic, as I said in my witness testimony, because I wanted to receive communion, even though I didn't really believe in all of what you should believe if you're Catholic. The last thing I will say, the very last thing that I believed as, as, you know, in my conversion was the eternity of hell. I was ready to believe everything in the catechism except that hell was forever. 
And that was really hard for me to believe. I thought I knew better. Hell can't be forever. Must eventually, you know, there must be a you know get out of jail card or something. And uh, I now realize that if there's one thing the devil doesn't want you to believe, it's that hell is forever. Because if hell isn't forever, anything goes, right? It doesn't really matter. If we live forever, it doesn't matter if you spend, you know, 200 million years in hell, because eventually you're going to end up like everybody else in heaven. The eternity of hell, I, I think the, the, the devil is completely, you know, made impotent if you believe in the eternity of hell. So anyway... But uh, the answer to your question is it was four years, I think, before I was baptized. It was about, um, it was about three years before I, I, you know, qualified for baptism, let's say. Uh, anyway, that's... Oh, and my parent. how did my family react? Um, my, it was very rough at the beginning. Well, actually, they were fine with it for the first three years because I didn't have the nerve to tell them. Um, <laughs> Uh, but then, I, then when I did tell him, my father went ballistic. Um, he really went ballistic. I have no son. My son is dead. I never want to hear, hear his name again and so forth. And, uh, but that didn't last forever. It lasted maybe six months. And, um, you know, his, his love kind of broke through a little bit. And he kind of very awkwardly got in touch with me again. But whenever anything reminded him of my conversion, he would go ballistic again. I remember he came once to my house. You know, I had, I, you know, I was a new convert. I was very enthusiastic. I had a big shroud of Turin face over my fireplace. I had statues of, you know, Mary. I had Mary on the wall, you know, or the Pieta. I had, I had St. Joseph. And uh, he came into my house and, he, you know, he got very mad. And he said, I'm never going to come here again. I said, what's the problem? They're all Jews, you know. Anyway. <laughs> it didn't go over. He didn't get it. Um, uh, but anyway, he, he was very upset for a long time. And, uh, you know, the only way he could forgive me is if he forgot about it and if anything reminded him. However, and my mother was actually more ambivalent, but she went along with my father. But the, uh, the bottom line is that the story has a very happy ending because I live in Naples, Florida. When they got too old to take care of themselves, I moved him down into an apartment in Naples, you know, one of these semi-assisted living apartments. And I kind of took care of him. You know, I would have dinner with him three or four times a week, five times a week. I had set everything up. I had found the place. I had moved him down. And, um, and uh, my father's heart kind of melted. You know, he said very nice things like, I never, I never thought I'd ever have a son like this, and I never deserved a son like this, which I had to agree with him, actually, but <laughs> it wasn't very nice of me to. But, um, but anyway, his heart melted, and, um, uh, and then he, you know, he had a fall. He was 102 and a half, I think. He had a fall, and he broke his thigh bone. He had all his wits. Um, uh, he had a better memory than I did, actually, at that point. But um, he fell and he broke his thigh bone. Things went downhill. He was in a lot of pain. He was in a, uh, yeah, they called it a rehab, but it was more of a hospice kind of situation. And um, uh, I checked him in one night. It was a horrible procedure. He was in even more pain. And the next morning when I went to visit him, he was sitting up in bed. His eyes were shining. And he said, you know, last night, after all the commotion was over and the room was dark and everyone had left, Jesus appeared to me. Interesting, don't you think? That's all he said. Interesting, don't you think? And then after that, when I would visit him, like once I forgot to wear this, and he said, where's that thing you wear around your neck? You really ought to wear it, you know? Anyway, and I was able to baptize him on Good Friday that year, and he died on Easter Tuesday. Um, and then my mother, then my mother actually got more hostile because not only had her son gone over to the enemy, but her husband had gone over to the enemy. And uh, she was really, really hostile, but more or less the same thing happened to her. And um, I baptized her when I thought she was at the point of death, but she got a lot stronger, and she lived for about another four or five weeks, and there was time there. After, after that, after I baptized her, all she wanted was um, for my wife and I to say the rosary by her bed or the Divine Mercy Chaplet. And um, I was able, I invited our priest in, and he... Um, Let's see, he couldn't baptize her because I baptized her. Um, he gave her, he, he confirmed her. 
He gave her an apostolic blessing. He vested her with the brown scapular. He gave her last rites. And um, he was a, a, Trinity, a, tr a traditional mass priest. It was FSSP parish that I was in. And she was buried out of a sung Tridentine uh, mass, the, the, you know, the full requiem mass, the incense, the Dies Irae chanted by the priest. We processed to the funeral. About half the parish came with us. Uh, the priest came in, you know, his, his black robes, you know, incensed the, the coffin and asperges the coffin and, you know, did all the readings and everything. And, you know, she was buried there. But the funniest thing was uh, it was a Jewish seminary, cemetery because I had bought the plot earlier. So anyway, so it had a very happy ending. It had a very, very happy ending. So the question is, how, how did my Jewish friends react? How do other Jews react um, to my conversion? Um, the, uh, I lost all, well, first of all, there's a very interesting difference between seriously religious Jews, like Orthodox Jews, Hasidic Jews, and conventional secular American Jews. And it's actually um, this, my, my normal American Jewish friends, uh, they just didn't want anything to do with me. They just thought I had gone nuts. I might as well have told them a spaceship landed in my backyard. I went up to Venus overnight. Now I go up to the mothership every week. You know, it was just like this guy's nuts and let's just not make him get violent, but let's, let's you know, let's just escape quietly from the room and, you know, before he, you know, goes bonkers. I had better luck with my Orthodox friends because with them, the issue was, could Jesus have been the Messiah? And so I actually maintained, the one Jewish friend I maintained a relationship with for a few years afterwards was an Orthodox Jew. And, uh, you know, he understood that, um, <laughs> that a lot of people thought, a lot of Jews over history had thought that Jesus was the Messiah, that this was nothing new, and that, you know, I just, you know, kind of became one of them. Uh, and it's still true, in other words, that, that pattern uh, continues. In other words, uh, it's much easier to deal with a Hasidic Jew or an Orthodox Jew, because then you can talk about whether Jesus was the Messiah. But to the normal American Jew who thinks the whole thing is a bunch of nonsense and you know, you're Jewish because you're born Jewish, you're Lutheran because you're born Lutheran, you know, you're Catholic because you're born Catholic, but it's not a matter of truth, you know, my truth, your truth, his truth, then it's just hopeless. So. Okay, no, that's, those are very good questions. First of all, about hell. I didn't see anything about hell in that first experience, and I know why. And the reason is I would have run in the other direction. In other words, I was in so much, I don't, want to, I don't want to make your ears burn, but I was in so much serious sin at that point in my life that um, I could not have borne the uh, knowledge of how much trouble I was in. And it took me years to extricate myself from that sin. Um, I mean, I was you know, living for things that I didn't even realize were sinful at the time. So God actually did not show me what a bad state I was in, and he did not show me about hell. He only showed me the, you know, the, the, the good side of things. Um, about seeing into the spiritual world, the way that happened was, you've probably never had this experience. Some of the people here who are more closer to my age might have had this experience, but it's happened to me. Like, I've, I've gone to the ballet, and you'll have a curtain that hides the stage. You'll have the house lights on. You just see this dark red curtain or whatever. And then the house lights go down and the lights shine on the front of the curtain. And you still just see the curtain. And then they will turn off the light shining from the outside on the curtain. And they'll turn on the stage lights behind the curtain. And all of a sudden the curtain will become transparent. And you'll see through the curtain onto the stage even though the curtain is still there. And that's what it was like. I saw through the physical world into the spiritual world. It wasn't like it was up there. It's like the entire physical world was in a, like a transparent screen over the, the spiritual world, which was the real world behind it. That, uh, that's why I couldn't understand how I could not have seen it. 
um, it's, it was like a, just a, like a almost transparent screen in front of the real world, which is the spiritual world. And um, there was a third question there. I, uh, um, oh, the, the angelic hierarchy. Oh, that's the most embarrassing, <laughs> the most embarrassing one to answer. Okay. Um, the, 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 the way I saw it was like, like an upside-down funnel uh, in, or a cone or something. But I thought of it as a funnel. And I saw um, like the, the lower rung was all of these um, you know, glorious angels essentially made out of light. Um, and then the next rung up was fewer but bigger. And then the next rung up was fewer but bigger and, and, and more glorious or more luminous until this upside down funnel disappeared into pure light, which I knew was God. I, I can't make sense out of it. I can just tell you what, you know, what I saw, so. Uh, sure, so the, the question was, about um, my, uh, the initial theophany, which is just a fancy word for, I don't know, revelation of God, um, and uh, my seeing how everything had been perfectly arranged in my life. However, it wasn't quite the way you characterize it. It's not like I saw like, oh, then I was five and this happened, and six I was, that happened, and so forth. I saw the truth of divine providence. In other words, what happened in this experience was was I, I think that technically it would probably be called an intellectual vision, but I, I just saw these truths. So I saw the truth of divine providence. I saw, in that sense, I saw that everything had been perfectly arranged, but it's not like I saw incident one, incident two, incident three. Um, and yes, divine providence, okay, and also, I can't be blamed for advertising because none of this stuff costs any money, but I, I have a YouTube channel, uh, it's called Jewish Catholic, not the Jewish Catholic, because someone else had that title. So, but anyway, if you spell my name right, you'll find it. Um, I have a, a, a YouTube podcast almost every day, and I have um, hundreds, literally hundreds up, um, and I have series, and I have a series on divine providence, which has about you know, eight or 10 shows on it. Um, I have a series called What is Judaism, which is uh, 12 episodes going through from uh, Abraham until the second coming. I, I'm actually, that I think is a good series. I have ones on saints and spiritualities and so forth. Um, and I think divine providence is very, very important because, because um, <laughs> uh, nothing, uh, I, what can I say? I don't think there's any way actually to, to be a believing Catholic if you don't believe fully in divine providence. I mean, in other words, if you think, okay, <laughs> I, I'm never coming back here anyway, right? So it doesn't matter if I get kicked out. <laughs> um, you know, people like to talk about God's ordaining will and God's permissive will, as though that means that some things happen because God wants them to happen, and some things happen because God just allows them to happen, but it's not really what he wanted to have happen. Um, that's not what ordaining will and permissive will is. If you think that way, then if, you know, if some guy T-bones your car and you get crippled, it's like, oh, well, God allowed that to happen, but he didn't want that guy to get drunk and he didn't want me to be crippled. It's just that he let that guy have free will and the guy's free will ended up with me being crippled. That's not, that's not understanding divine providence. It's not accepting divine providence. It's not understanding that everything in our lives is perfectly woven for our own good. The distinction between permissive will and ordaining will is not just that some bad things happen that God just you know, hasn't bothered stopping happening. The difference between ordaining will and permissive will is that, is that um, in a sense, God's first choice was for there to be no sin. And if there had been no sin, then there wouldn't be a need for suffering. There wouldn't be a need for the passion. There wouldn't be a need for us to contribute, be co-redeemers, you know, suffer and unite our suffering with the suffering of Christ. Um, and there wouldn't be need for our conversion, which suffering usually brings about and so forth. So uh, God does not will, does not will sin. He does not want that guy 
you know, to drive drunk. That's not God's ordaining will that that guy should drive drunk. But the only thing that is in God's will is the fact of sin. And the, the consequences, the way that those free will actions, those free will sinful actions affect you is God's ordaining will. And, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I don't want to put you on the spot. But, and, and nobody wants to say that. And of course, pastorally, you don't say that. You know, if, if when, a, when a widow comes to you and her husband just died, you don't say, ha ha, well, that's the best thing for you and the best thing for him, so buck up. Um, I mean, you, you know, you've got, you got, you got to be tactful and stuff. And, but the, the truth is that suffering is necessary. It's the most necessary. Padre Pio said, if men understood the true value of suffering, they would never pray for anything else. You know, so anyway, that's, and that's, that's why this is a particular, you know, I, I think it's really important. You can't, how can you live in peace if you don't think that what's happening is, is divine providence. Look at the world. I, I had this conversation with, with John when he was driving me here. Okay, okay, <laughs> excuse me. But as I said, I don't have to be invited back. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we don't have elections anymore. We know that. We, we, we don't even know if the person who's pretending to be president is president, whether it's him, whether it's three body doubles, God knows. <laughs> You know, we have, you know, we have this absolute insanity around us. And um, so one question you could ask is like, is like, well, how's going, God going to fix this? You know, this isn't, you know, this doesn't make any sense. Or is the issue that we have been hell-bent on sinning as a society and as a culture for the last 50 years, that we have just been... Uh, in the aggregate, getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, it started, well, I don't mean it started with, but, you know, first contraception was a controversial issue, and then contraception goes without saying, then abortion is a controversial issue, then abortion goes without saying, you know, now even, you know, LBGPTQ, whatever, you know, goes without saying. It's like, how much, what's God going to do in the face of that sin? And what we're seeing in the state of the world is not what God wants as a first choice, but it's a consequence of the sin that has been chosen, and in some way it's woven into divine providence. So I can actually, <laughs> I can actually even be peaceful reading, I, well, reading the newspaper doesn't do any good, but I can be peaceful reading the websites I read, because you know, God's in charge, and the problem isn't what's happening. The problem is the sin. So anyway. Uh, I'm, well, I, I mean, I, I, I suspect that the prophecy that you're referring to, or the whatever, is that um, the abomination of desolation will sit in the holy place and um, uh, will rule for, I forgot, three and a half years or something. And, um, uh, and people have always wondered, you know, what's the abomination of desolation and what's the holy place? And, and um, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I have friends all over the map. Um, you know, some, some, people, some people think it is a return, a rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem and the Antichrist seated in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, <laughs> Some people think that it's not about Jerusalem, it's about Rome. I'll leave that aside. Um, and I don't have any insight as to, uh, I mean, as to how that prophecy will, in hindsight, be seen to have been fulfilled. Um, and uh, frankly, that's true of the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah also. I mean, in other words, you know, people say, you know, there are whatever, 450 prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament, and why don't the Jews realize that Jesus, you know, was a, was a fulfillment of those prophecies? But um, it, that's easy to say looking backwards, but looking forwards, I mean, in other words, if you're a Jew 2,000 years ago, you know, how can he be from Bethlehem, and, uh, you know, where is he really from? from and you know what's he doing riding on an ass and you know 
the, the stuff in hindsight is obvious how it was fulfilled, but if you were trying to predict what it actually means and visualize it, I think it would have been pretty hopeless. And I think this is kind of like that. We'll know looking backwards how the prophecy was fulfilled. But um, I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> I'm going to tell the truth. Um, uh, I, I, used, I, I used to be friends with, with Mel Gibson, and he thought the abomination of the desolation in the holy place was the Novus Ordo Mass. So, you know, people, you know, people can, can read those prophecies and, and, and paste anything they want on them, and I think it's only going to be backwards that we'll know what they meant. Okay, okay thank you for the question. The question is, is what role does... Um, reverence and sacramentality and, and liturgy or whatever played and so forth. But I'm going to go back. I, actually, that ties in with the last answer. Um, the, um, the, the, the way I became friends with Mel Gibson is he read an interview. Of, he didn't read the interview of mine, but a friend of his read the interview of mine and gave him a copy, and he got in touch with me. And the reason what happened in that interview was I, I just mentioned that as a Jew in the Catholic Church, it was actually the, uh, the old liturgy that made a lot more sense to me than the new liturgy. Because Judaism has a very high sense of sacramentality in the sacred. I mean, for instance, um, well, I don't want to say it's trivial, but uh, you know, in the Catholic Church, traditionally, you have the um, tabernacle in the center, uh, you have a light burning continually over the tabernacle, telling you that God is there. Um, only the priest's hands can touch the Eucharist. If, if the uh, Eucharist falls to the ground, or if, if the Eucharist has to be disposed of, it has to be buried in the ground, it can't just be thrown away and so forth. Um, in, in the synagogue, you have the um, Ark of the Covenant in the center, on the center line, you, you have a dais, you don't have an altar, but you have a dais, and it's a great honor to be invited up to the dais. Um, you have, in the Ark of the Covenant, you have the Torah scroll, which is, which is the holiest thing in Judaism. The, the, um, the Ark has a light that's always supposed to be burning on top of it. If a Torah scroll has to be disposed of because it gets too old to be used, it gets buried in a funeral. If the Torah scroll falls to the ground, everyone present has to fast in reparation. Um, the, uh, one's hand isn't supposed to touch the Torah scroll, so when one reads it, one uses a silver pointer. You know, it's very, the sense of the, the sacramental purity and separateness of the sacred from the profane is, is very parallel. I don't think it's a coincidence. And so, and the Carthusian monastery, by the way, I didn't know about the Tridentine Mass, but the Carthusian Mass is basically, they have permission to celebrate the, or their Mass from the 11th century. So it's essentially like a Tridentine Mass. And um, so anyway, that just made a lot more sense to me. And I always kind of resonated with that. And I, I said this in this interview, and that's how blah, 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 that came about. Um, I mean, I now understand. I mean, I now, I mean, I go, I mean, I, I, a mass is a mass, and I'm very happy to go to a Novus Ordo Mass and everything. Um, it's not my fault that an FSSP parish opened two miles from where I live in Naples, but, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's very nice. Um, anyway, so the, the Jew, if, if for an Orthodox Jew, the, the, uh, it would be very hard to buy a, a cap, I don't want to say, I don't know how to put it, a um, overly contemporary Catholic Mass because the sense of the sacred is just, just too imbued. It's just uh, in there too deep. I know, I know Hasidic, I mean, I, I have some friends who are Hasidic Jews who have entered the Catholic Church or want to enter the Catholic Church. And um, uh, in all cases, they are the, the Catholic environment that they are exposed to is an extremely reverent, like high liturgy Catholic environment. Um, so. I, don't, I don't think it's a matter of points of view. I think, I think, that, I think that one has to um, uh, respect 
uh, respect them and respect um, their, their, their goodwill and their error or whatever. But I, I don't think there's anything to respect in their error per se. Uh, I, I, I mean, if, you know, like, like uh, in the case of a, a Jew, you know, it's like, okay, I understand that you don't think Jesus was the, was the Jewish Messiah. I understand that your rationale for thinking he wasn't the Jewish Messiah is because, let's say, you think that when the Jewish Messiah comes, there'll be peace on earth and all the dead will go back into life and so forth. But um, the, the truth of the matter is, if you actually even know the Talmud, that the Talmud says that there'll be two messiahs, the first one to suffer and die, and the second one to usher in the kingdom of heaven, and you're just confusing the first coming with the second coming. You know, so, but that's not like, that's not like re respecting their point of view. It's just understanding where their error is. Um, so that's the best I can do in answering your, I, I don't know if that's responding to your question or not, but, but you know, there's one truth. There's one truth. And either you're right or you're wrong. And it's a very awkward situation to be a Catholic and be right about everything. And any, anything <laughs> that other people disagree with, they happen to be wrong about it. But it's the truth. I mean, it's the fact. I mean, you're nice about it, but you don't have to respect the fact that somebody's wrong. I mean, you can respect the fact that they're wrong, but you can't, you sh there's no need to respect the error as an error. And this is going to be my last preaching. <laughs> um, that's the way to evangelize, is to let people see what you have. And, and you don't even have to tell them about what you have. In other words, if people are aware of, um, of your sense of intimacy with God, your sense of divine providence, the, um, the joy you get from receiving the Eucharist, why you're happy after you go to Mass, um, you know, the, the, your sense of um, the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in your life, the peace you get from praying to Mary or whatever. They can think you're nuts. That's absolutely fine. But if they see what you have and what it means to you, and they, they're going to know they don't have it, and they're going to want it. Okay, so, the, you know, you don't have to address their error. Just let them know your truth, so to speak. And it'll plant a seed that may take 10 years or 20 years to sprout, or it might never sprout. But if you ask me, that's where things come from. And I said in my witness testimony that the only guy at MIT that I wanted as a roommate was a devout Catholic. And it's not easy to find a devout Catholic at MIT. But, um, <laughs> you know, but that planted a seed. That planted a seed. So anyway, so that's, that's, you know, much, to me, it's much, that's much closer to the heart of evangelization than understanding why they're wrong about what they're wrong about. Anyway, thank you very much.